My name is Karen Cooney. I am the director of the Viralist Center for Art and Politics. And I'd like to welcome you to this uh, exceptional series and a long-standing collaboration with the Public Art Fund, whereby the Public Art Fund brings exceptional, unusual, and truly uh, important artists to New York City and the New School um, through these talks. The fall uh, series of lectures has been bundled around the topic of the limits of the object, which uh, by the Public Art Fund and coincides with our own interest in investigations into the nature of matter and things that we at the Verily Center uh, pursue in a number of um, additional other events. Um, the, the limit of the object can be defined in many different ways, and it extends uh, beyond the material, uh, the confines of matter that we usually uh, define it by. So I would even like to venture as far as saying that you all here and other people downtown at this um, significant historic and important gathering are in some ways part of the same object, of the same uh, in search for uh, new understandings of what our society means and how we connect through materials and through such interventions as sculptural, um, uh, of a sculptural nature that the Public Art Fund brings to you. So I find it very uh, wonderful and a uh, fortuitous coincidence to have Paola Peavy uh, speak to us tonight who will now be introduced by Nicholas Baum, the uh, artistic curate, artistic director and executive director <laughs> of the Public Art Fund. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Karen. I, I think I just got a promotion. Uh, anyway, it's, it's great, um, of course, to be back at the new school. Uh, we are in competition. Uh, with the, the protest that, uh, uh, that Karen mentioned, um, but I'm, I'm glad that even if a part of the body politic is there, that this part remains here, um, because I think uh, I'm personally very excited to have the chance to see Paola talk about her work. We've had many conversations about it, but not, of course, this kind of... Uh, overview and presentation that I think we're in for tonight. Um, I want to thank Karen for her warm introduction as always and, and Pam, uh, Tillis and their colleagues here at the New School, um, a really fantastic venue for us, a place filled with ideas uh, and a great context to explore perhaps some of those ideas but in relation to sort of the specific practice of an artist. The limits of an object idea that Karen mentioned really examines sort of the transformative potential of sculpture, its ability to reach beyond the material presence of an object's physical form. Alaska-based Italian artist Paola Peavy's installations, sculptures, performances, and photographs create astonishing, poetic, and enigmatic associations. They bring together surprising references from our everyday world, orchestrating such unexpected scenarios as a gallery petting zoo, a transport truck flipped on the side of a road, a hundred Chinese people gathered in a gallery, a leopard traversing a gallery filled with cups of cappuccino. Likened to an experiential playground, her work ultimately subverts our expectations of the way objects function in the world, challenging us by presenting the inconceivable as real. Born in Milan, Paola has exhibited widely throughout Europe, the Middle East, and the Asia Pacific. She's participated in many important international group exhibitions, and was awarded the Golden Lion at, Award at the Venice Biennale in 1999. She's represented by Massimo Di Carlo in Milan, uh, by Emmanuel Perrotin in Paris. In New York, however, she hasn't had uh, a lot of opportunity to uh, present her work and ideas. And in fact, this is the very first time uh, that she's presenting a public lecture in New York. So I'm delighted to welcome Paola Peavy.
Hello. Thank, thank you for coming. Can I have my computer? I will show you a film from my performance, I Wish I Am Fish. Just five minutes. Okay, 
So I was invited in New Zealand to do a project that would last 24 hours. And that is the performance that I did. Um, the title is I Wish I Am Fish. Um, it all started with a um, drawing by Dylan Horrocks. Um, I asked him to draw my idea of uh, an airplane where the pa passengers were all fish. And so he, he drew this, and I used it for my invitation card. And then I had a three hours long performance with the airplane um, with only the fish, and there were about 10 people on the airplane. Uh, I was on the plane, and two pilots, um, two stewards, a uh, filmmaker, photographer, curator. And then um, we flew for three hours um, in New Zealand. In the middle of the three hours, we landed in the airport in Auckland. And we had an opening. So the people could come onto the plane and uh, see the fish. And after uh, maybe one hour of this opening situation, we flew again. And that's why in the film there are two takeoffs and um, it takes a long time. You can see it's daytime and then nighttime. The same night, uh, I had to complete the 24 hours project. And so the same night, um, a video of the performance was projected downtown in Oakland. So this was 1000, uh, a performance at Tate Modern in 2010, where um, I asked 1000 people to come and be performers and uh, scream one scream, only one breath all together. And it was important for me that it was unrehearsed. So the people that you see here on the on this part of the turbine hall at Tate Modern uh, are the performers, all this group. And this is the audience, and this is the audience, and this is the audience. 
And um, I really like this woman here. <laughs> this work was very traumatic because it was the biggest I've ever done and the shortest I've ever done. So um, it was over in 40 seconds, the scream of the performers. Uh, the other screams that you heard afterwards were the screams of the audience. And um, uh, I never had such a, a strong um, um, down mood after an artwork as, as in this one. And now I would like to show you another five minutes film from my performance, 100 Chinese, in 
会。I redid this performance seven years later uh, at the Freeze Art Fair in the booth of the Vron Gallery, invited by Massimiliano Gioni, Maurizio Catalan, and Ali Subotnik. And this time, uh, only 50 Chinese were doing the performance. Um, I think there is a huge difference between um, 1998 and 2005. And um, in the art world and in the um, relationship with uh, Chinese people. Now I would like to show you my, one of my last artworks. Um, I'm on the web. This is the website of my artwork. Uh, it's a public artwork. Um, I, I have been invited to do a public artwork in Rotterdam on a street that is um, central but ugly and violent and uh, abandoned. So the budget was very generous from Rotterdam City and so I thought rather than placing an object, I thought I could do something uh, more interesting. So I decided to do this, which is girl jamming squeak. Very difficult to explain, now I'll try. It's uh, what it is um, uh, from the um, outside, oh, I don't even have a picture from the outside. From the outside, this is what you see. So I took, um, this, this building was there already. Uh, it was all glass. It was the entrance of an old bank, abandoned. There are lots of abandoned um, uh, spaces in this street. And uh, I turned this empty space into Grr, jamming squeak, which is a recording studio like a professional recording studio for musicians to record. Um, but the, um, the studio was open for free to anybody. And um, it was open for about 12, uh, 14 months. And inside the studio, there were always two people working, uh, one sound engineer and another person, I always call him the manager of the studio. So um, the only, thing was that the studio was available together with all the microphones, computers, sound engineer, manager. Um, it also had 20 musical instruments like a guitar, um, piano, drum set, uh, flute, um, electronic uh, uh, synthesizers. But people uh, had to use also some sound of animal when they used the studio, when they created music or performed music or recorded music or jammed inside the studio. So the studio offered um, 100 different recordings of animal sounds. So I will give you some examples. So I'm using the website because the point of this work is that it's an, an artwork, but it's public, it's for everybody. It was absolutely free, I forgot to say. So these are some examples of the 100 animals that were um, available. So some very 
Coyote, for example. So the recordings of the animals were one hour long, each of them. Some animals are very surprising. This is the walrus. This, this was a walrus. Uh, the animal sounds uh, were given to me by the Macalau Library at the Cornell University here in the US. And um, so here in the website, there is a top hit of uh, some of the uh, music recorded by people who use the studio. The studio just closed last July. Um, so people could use it for free, could record and take away the product exactly as if they went to a professional recording studio. So they could decide to take away all the separate tracks or they de could decide to sit with the sound engineer and do the, all the mixing and mastering. Or they could, um, if they were not professionals, they could decide just to have a quick CD and uh, quickly um, a quick final product. And um, so, and they did not even have to give us uh, their name. We were open to anybody. We were just offering. It was like a utopic artwork for me. So this is a top hit made by the manager. Uh, I kind of disagree with his taste, but I will um, let you hear some something. Uh, Spinvis, for example, here is uh, a very famous uh, Dutch musician who um, gave a big concert, again for free, at the opening of Girl Jamming Squeak. So if you want to listen the whole song, it's available. But for example, I would like to uh, listen a minute to the first. Uh, it's uh, it's just a child who went there with mama and um, the plate. Okay, what on? A one, a two, a one, two, three, four. Schaapje. Schaapje. Heb je vrienden? Hey, kom hier. Yeah. Ja, baas, ja, baas, ja, ba 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 
right. So the studio was available really to everybody. Um, you know, my, my ideal was, for example, an uncle could go there with a nephew and they could do a professional CD and go home and teach each other and, uh, and uh, forcing people to use animal sounds, of course, meant uh, forcing people to let go of a certain structure and a uh, little bit forcing people to improvise and to be more primitive and to, um, you know, acknowledge existence of animals and and uh, the studio also gave uh, free events where uh, the studio, when the studio invited um, artists or musicians or um, um, performers to. Um, to do an event using the studio and therefore using the animals. So upcoming, there is no more because it's closed, but in the archive, um, for example, for example, David Cunningham, this event was organized by me personally. Um, incredible artist and musician from London came to, um, to the studio and gave a free concert. And all these were a constructed world. Um, all these were um, other free events by um, local bands and artists or international musicians stopping by and, and so on. And uh, it says booking here because for shy people it could also be booked with uh, closed doors, always for free, always with the sound engineer and the manager, just assisting you and giving you the microphone and this, and do you want to play the wolf or do you want to play the guitar or... Of course, this art ca comes also from my life in Alaska, where people jam together and animals are always around the corner. And now I'd like to show you some photos from Girl Jamming Squeak to, to try to give you an insight. So this was from the outside. The photos of the animals are photos by Vincent Musi who did them for National Geographic, trying to picture the mind of the animal. This was the inside from upstairs. There were two floors upstairs. This was the opening concert by Spinvis. So this is the recording room. Spinvis is inside the recording room and the audience is outside in the um, other side, other outside the recording room, the soundproof reco recording room. So this is the inside the, the artwork, but outside the recording room, which had large windows to allow. This was upstairs. On top of the recording room, there was a listening lounge. This was the work at night. This is Culture Brothers performing inside, so you can see you had anything you would like to have, I tried to give. This photo, I put it here because it kind of uh, shows what I wanted to create. This comes from the event by A Constructed World, Australian artist now living in Paris. Mm -hmm. Jeff with a white and Jackie at the right are A Constructed World. And um, in this event and in many, it's, it's what they're doing recently, they create a group of 
professional musicians, uh, non-professional musicians, artists and curators, and they improvise, not really improvise, they also prepare um, concerts, um, performances. It's, it's very um, wild and crazy. This was from the performance of David Cunningham. Oops. I like to show you like a minute of the performance of David Cunningham. And now I'd like to show you more usual works. This is a helicopter upside down in a public square in Salzburg, uh, 2006. It was a real helicopter, a Westland Wessex, put upside down. And this is uh, untitled Zebras, and it's a photographic work. I brought the zebras um, from the circus onto some mountains in Italy that are not touristic, and therefore they are very empty. And for two days, we left the zebras um, free, and we just followed them and took pictures of them. So it's a performative work, but the performance was private because the audience would have disturbed. And so I show it as a photographic work only. This is Untitled Donkey, a photographic work. I used to live in a tiny island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, and there were no cars, only donkeys on this island. So this was, I wouldn't say normal, but... And this is uh, one cup of cappuccino, then I go. A performance that I did in 2007 in Kunstale Basel. This is a photographic work from the performance. In this case, I wanted the performance to be public. Um, I, over the two big rooms of the ground floor of the Kunstale Basel, at the end, I built a huge cage um, that 
spanned across the two rooms. So the, cage, the leopard inside the cage could go in two rooms, and the people also could go in the same two rooms, but outside of the cage. There were two doors, one inside the cage and one outside the cage, between the two rooms. And I wanted to do a public performance, but uh, I, I decided to do pictures in the morning and film in the morning, and then the public performance at 6 o'clock. But immediately when the leopard was delivered, uh, it, he, the leopard was very, very, very scary. And the policeman who was there, um, I guess it, it was necessary to have a policeman there when we have a leopard, uh, immediately said, you don't have permission to show it to the people. So, um, well, you know, there was not even the point to start a conversation with the director to decide whether we can show something so scary or not to the audience. I wanted to put a sign, tell the audience it's going to be scary, come in at your own choice. And um, But anyway, the police took away the permission, so we did, did, not, we did not have to uh, go into this discussion. The director, Adam Sinsmik, uh, was of the opposite idea. He thought there was no time to prepare the sign in a professional way, which was true, and therefore he thought, or maybe that was a little bit of an excuse, and, but he thought that is not right to show art that is very, very scary to people. You know, people could get um, sick or something. And so the performance in the end was only private because the leopard was taken out of the cage uh, right uh, at six o'clock when the opening started. And this is another photographic work. It's a one way from the same performance, of course. And this was the setup uh, that I did before bringing the leopard. I put 3,000 cappuccino cups and the earth, the ground, as requested by the owner of the leopard and the house for the leopard. It was requested by the owner of the leopard. And uh, everything else was kind of like my art. All these cappuccino cups, they were fake, of course. And then this is how the leopard did it. In five minutes, everything was upside down. And uh, this, uh, here I wanted to show you also the cage. Um, we were really, really, really terrified. Um, the cage was built by the main technician of the museum. And um, up at the very top, six meters high, there was a hole, you see, between the windows and the... So we spent two, three weeks before the arrival of the leopard debating, you know, is the, is the fence strong enough and uh, will the leopard find a hole? And uh, all of us, we thought of a leopard as you would think of a cat, you know, like a small thing and he would walk around. And, and when the leopard arrived, and you see that door on the left, so the cage went also in the other room behind. So people would go this, from this door on the left and the leopard could go inside from the door on the right. So when the leopard arrived, there was this huge uh, wooden crate and um, already it was, um, uh, the leopard inside the crate was uh, moving. Was, the whole crate was going like <laughs> And so then, um, because it had been in the truck, I think for two, three hours, so it wanted to run. So as soon as we put the leopard, the, the, the crate was put next to the door, and the leopard went inside, and the leopard started running like, like finally, you know, he can stretch, and he started running everywhere. And I did not think about this, um, but the, the, all the cups were tumbling under the feet of the leopard, and so the leopard, uh, the noise was very loud, and uh, we human beings, we hear that noise of breaking cups only when we are fighting or when, or when there is an earthquake. So immediately, that 
loud noise of um, uh, cups falling uh, was very terrifying. The leopard was huge, it was like two meters long, and he was running like a crazy man. And we all thought of the hole on the top of the six meters, oh my God. And then, of course, everybody working in the museum was right here in front of this fence. And we had what, um, we had like a, an emotional reaction. I think the fear multiplied from each of us. So we all became green and terrified. The policeman said, no way, I'm never gonna give permission to you to open this. We were all like really terrified. And um, the owner of the leopard was inside the cage with the leopard and he was really upset at all of us because he was so happy that the leopard was running around and we were not taking pictures and we were all green and terrified. And um, so the owner of the leopard was really upset and just <laughs> Then the leopard immediately felt all this exactly and started playing with us. He started running from the door, the, from the right, and throwing his whole body, which was huge, uh, onto the fence, which was huge. The fence was moving like that, a nightmare. My, my gallerist came maybe 20 minutes later she came in from there, and she found 30 people here, green and sweating, and you know, big, uh, big signs under our eyes. We're like in a panic, and she's like, "Okay, what's wrong?" So it, it really happened. This um, uh, emotion growing in the in the group. Uh, I really experienced that. But anyway, when when the, and then at six o'clock, the leopard was taken out. And the public came in, and you could tell that something uh, uh, not human had uh, moved all the cups, and um, there were marks of the feet of the leopard everywhere in the in the walls. And so the the installation um, was very much uh, working for me anyway. So this was the first room in the show at Kunstale Basel. Uh, these sculptures are two meters high, like six feet high, and they are made of those ribbons that um, flowers are tied. If you buy flowers, you get the ribbon. So these are thousands and thousands and thousands of ribbons hanging from here and loose at the bottom, and it's all full. This was also in the same show, and this is Ali Kudi project. It's uh, a photo of the island where I used to live, uh, taken from, the, from a boat, uh, printed as large as the island is in reality. So it's a work in progress. This is part of the print. So basically what it means is that this kind of rock, which is a rock on the beach, this is the beach line, this is the water, is exactly uh, that big if you went to the beach. This is, have you seen me before? This is Life is Great. They're um, same size as a real polar bear. I guess it's nine feet tall. This is What's My Name. I'll show you another video of, I'll show you the artwork first, so that, this is called, um, it's a cocktail party. Um, the liquids are, ink, uh, orange juice, but in the video I used olive oil. This is red wine, uh, water, uh, facial cream, espresso coffee. In the middle is um, um, 
water and almond syrup, and then glycerin in the back, and the green one is uh, water and asperula syrup. So there were nine parts in this artwork, and when the people enter the room, they um, wore, I gave them these um, plastic raincoats, because they, um, there was a lot of splashing. Uh, you can see all the splashes here. So this work was installed at Porticus in Frankfurt and in the gallery Massimo De Carlo in Milan. And uh, every day they had to clean the floor and refill the liquids. And there was a lot of the strong smell in the room from all the, all the liquids. And uh, the noise of the waterfall, um, I found out later, uh, triggers something in our brain and makes us euphoric and happy. And uh, so this effect that we have when we reach a waterfall in nature was present in the room of this artwork too. People got really happy and euphoric and... Yeah, maybe I wanna show you actually more pictures about this. how it really worked on the people. That's, that's what I wanted to show you. It really brought out this kind of behavior from people. This work is called, if you like it, thank you. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. Enjoy anyway. And it's a grid mm, covered in rhinestones. Rhinestones are the fake diamonds. <laughs> this is um, what goes round, art comes round. It's an installation with 24 bear rugs. The bear rugs are fake. 
This is from Galerie Emmanuel Perrotin. Basically, they go all around. This is Untitled Pearls. This is what I'm working on at the moment. Uh, they are sculptures of miniature vitra chairs, uh, all together uh, held in a lamp. This is called Interesting, a performance with white animals uh, roaming free in the space. I did this uh, in my solo show at Trussardi Foundation, um, invited by Massimiliano Gioni. So the, the visitor would uh, come in from, from where we are, and first there was a room with fish and um, white fish in tanks and um, some other white birds in big, big, um, I don't know the name, those big cages for birds. And then the visitors would come in here and have this view and they would be greeted by a person uh, working for the show who would accompany them through the um, through the room, because uh, of course it can be a little bit sketchy to walk through um, the animals. And the, the show lasted for a long time, maybe six weeks. And there was a big social life going on amongst the white animals. So you had to go through to go to the next work, which is Untitled Airplane, an airplane upside down. You can see in the back. And when you went through all the way, then you got to this huge room, um, which contains Guitar Guitar, which is an installation of thousands and thousands of objects that are identical two by two. So for example, you see here this washing machine, there are two. So many things are closed, the pairs are closed, like this uh, two orange things, but other objects, uh, the, the, the pair is, uh, is um, messy. So the tractor, there was another tractor uh, behind the point of view of the picture, and uh, there was a car and a roulotte, and there were two of everything. Questions? Um, could you talk a little bit about how you generate the ideas for your work? How do you, they're so diverse and disparate, uh, how do they kind of come to be? Um, it comes inside my head. Like, um, um, I feel reluctant to say this almost as if somebody could take this away from me, but I think nobody can take it away because it's what we all have, you know, like we wake up in the morning and you think, oh, I want to eat uh, croissant today. So in the same way, that's the same idea. It comes inside my head. I want to do free Tibet candy. It just comes like a finished product, all the works or most of the works. But to uh, make, make the ground for this to come, I try to make my life as great as possible. And it does not mean um, in terms of life, not in terms of, I don't know, the usual society standards of great life, but in terms of um, development of thought. This is the biggest, um, you know, like our thinking capacity is really the biggest thing we all have. And so I, I, I really try to make that very deep, just like life. I make it as um, 
as true and as uh, interesting and uh, as possible. Then ideas come. They come from life. I noticed in the years when I spend, when I uh, work too much, like the business side of my work, then uh, ideas don't come. So I always try to make my life very interesting. Now that I live in Alaska, that uh, thanks to my husband, I'm in a Tibetan family, <laughs> that I just go around the world like a crazy woman and I'm interested in the Eskimo culture. My life is very interesting. Um, I just have a quick question about the titles of the works. A lot of them are really playful and um, seem sort of personal. And I'm just curious um, if you intend, when people hear the titles of the work, for that to sort of change the way that they think about what they're seeing. So uh, I have to admit that the titles come from my husband, Karma Lama, who is a poet, composer, musician. So they come from him. Sometimes, once in a blue moon, I also have a nice title. Some come from me. But most of the time, it's untitled, 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 untitled. And then he came along, and he has these great words coming from his mouth. So sometimes I write them, and then I use them. Or sometimes I show him the art, and I say, what's the title for this? And he comes out with the title. And these uh, words are so en engaging and opening. You know, It's like opening the door. So. I feel they do not divert the, the experience of the work. If they did, I would not use them if I thought they did. But actually, they help. Because maybe now this is stopping, but especially before, people always close the door in front of my artwork. They are a little bit scared and a little bit. But maybe the title help to relax. It's not going to bite. Hi. Um, maybe just to, to uh, hone in on one piece in particular, the um, 100 Chinese in a Gallery piece. Maybe you could talk a little bit about your inspiration for that piece, um, what you found was different when you briefly mentioned that when you redid it, you found that a lot had changed, and um, you know where you, where you were trying to go with that piece. I lived in Shanghai in 1998 and 1999, and... Um, uh, I completely fell in love with the Chinese people and culture and way of life. Uh, especially in those years, uh, there were very few Westerns in Shanghai. We were just, I guess, a hand. It felt like we were a handful, and um, China was still like another planet. I I had amazing times there because it really felt like another planet. Every single thing was different from the color of the sky to every single human interaction was absolutely different from Western society. And so I was completely fascinated by Chinese people and I noticed that when a few of them had were wearing the same clothes and this had nothing to do with the uniform, um, their facial features would really stand out. And so that's, my work was like an experiment. What if I put many of them uh, together with these same clothes and see what happens? And I think in uh, um, Eastern society, the individual is actually more developed than in Western society, even though this is probably mm, difficult to believe um, because I think in Western society we are all machines working for the big machine and in Eastern society the individual is more developed I think as in their, in their personality. So if you look in, in that, my work in, in that performance there are many things but also there is uh, each single one of them stands out incredibly strong. And also, I'm very interested in this beautiful difference between races that we still have. I guess in the future, we will not have that. And this, this um, 
just juxtaposition of the you know the difference it's it's like a discovery uh, did I answer your question so th and then when I redid it so Actually, when I did it in 1998 in Gallery Massimo De Carlo, it was with the Chinese living in Milan, and they did not speak Italian. So there was, um, there was, um, it was really China in the gallery. Um, I hired performers, like you would hire actors, but they did not speak Italian. So they had actually been tricked by the organizer who was the only one speaking Chinese, who was, um, who, inv to gather 100 Chinese actors, he uh, contacted 10 restaurant owners in Milan to bring 10 each. What happened is that the 10 restaurant owners just asked their friends and family come over for a photo, and um, they uh, stole the daily paycheck of all the 100 people. So all these Chinese came to the gallery for a photo and they came full of uh, jewelry and makeup and beautiful clothes because they thought they were posing for a photo. So already there was a big misunderstanding there. But through the day, I managed to do the film and the photos. But when it came to the performance with the audience, which of course was explained to the organizer but was not explained to the performers, after five minutes, they exploded, of course, and um, they wanted to, they actually stopped the performance, of course, after five minutes, and it was the new space of Massimo De Carlo, who just moved from Via Bocconi to Viale Corsica. It was my first solo show. I was very young, and suddenly, five minutes into my show, 100 Chinese, are all over the place screaming like crazy in Chinese that they want to go away because their clothes were, because of safety reasons, were locked so that, of course, you know, because it was their belongings. Uh, so they were screaming in Chinese and, and, and then I was begging them to stay another five minutes, we're gonna pay more, but that's when I discovered that they were not paid at all. Because the organizer started screaming to me, how do you dare talking to them about money? It's like, okay, then. Um, so, the, so now seven years later, the Vron Gallery uh, was doing these performance, performances at the Freeze Art Fair. And they wanted to repeat this performance, also remembering that the performance lasted only five minutes. And so we took a huge amount of work in organizing it so that every single one of our actors, performers, people knew exactly what their job and duty was. And, and so it went very smoothly. Um, they performed for four days at the wrong gallery booth. And, but um, the, the, um, the big difference is if you look at the picture, uh, I just noticed when I was preparing, because I, I never look again at my work, um, but I just noticed when I prepared this picture to show you that it's a huge different world. Well, it's London rather than Milan, so probably there is maybe a 25 years, it's like being 25 years into the future rather than seven, but I just noticed that there was a huge different um, way to perform in contemporary art in those seven years had become public. This is my perception in Europe, I don't know, in the US. And um, also the relationship with Chinese also was open between 1998 and 2005. What, what do you think? Put me on the spot. Um, no, I mean, I was just intrigued. I was just intrigued by the concept of st racial stereo profiling, really, um, and getting. You know, I wanted to know why you chose this particular race. Uh, of course, we. I think. I guess uh, to stereotype even some more. In the West, we have this notion of Chinese as being very community oriented, kind of the opposite of what you were saying. Um, and so it seemed. To, I was wondering if you were playing off that. It seemed like. Uh, you were, but you were playing against it. 
um, you know, to me it kind of seemed like, uh, I don't know, I guess to me it kind of seemed as though they were all put together to say that they're very similar. Um, that's kind of how I seemed. And it also seemed indicative in their behavior to me, um, where like some people would kneel down and then other people would kind of follow that lead almost instinctively. And I was just trying to discern from their movements, from their gestures, whether you were playing from that um, more individualistic kind of standpoint or more communitarian kind of standpoint. That's, that's all. Um, when I asked them to uh, sit down, uh, it was like a game. It was really just like a game uh, because um, I, I don't go to China since 1999, but in 1999, they were sitting down everywhere. You always see them sitting like that, and it's impossible, for example, for me, my body, to sit like that. So I just wanted to see what it's like when the whole group sits down together. So it was just like a game, and... Uh, and then, um, but regarding the, the um, you know, uh, because of the fear of uh, uh, racist violence, so we cannot say that we are different, but I think all this is an hypocrisy. We are beautifully different, but this work I was able to do, but for example, another work I had in mind with, uh, black people, it was impossible to do it, even though some black people I asked had no problem with it, but the white people had problems with me doing this work because um, they, that would, would not go through. There was too much memory of the violence suffered, and, um, um, well, Hi, um, I just wanted to ask you because it stuck with me through the presentation. When you were presenting the piece, uh, the Tate Modern, you said that it that for you it was a very traumatic experience, and I remember you said something like um, the you had like a down mood way greater than with most pieces you have done, and I wanted you to explain why was that, and if it happens with every project, and it just was stronger in this particular piece? Uh, yeah, the down mood comes. Uh, so um, it comes after you do something big um, or something you do for a long time, then it's done, it, it comes, but it's, it's no big deal. Um, uh, I, I, I don't focus on that. It's just that piece was incredibly strong, maybe because I worked so hard with many people for so many months to organize 1,000 people to come with name. Oh yeah, because actually every single performer was paid 20 pounds. And the idea was that either they, take, they keep it for themselves or they donated it to a charity. In that way, uh, groups of people, it didn't have to be charity, even like groups of friends could come all together each of them would make 20 pounds and they could raise a nice sum. So this is the way um, we thought of to gather 1,000 people with name and uh, because I wanted to be, I did not want to say come and scream with me. I wanted to have 1,000 performer who would follow my instructions to scream one time at a given moment in one breath unrehearsed. And um, then what happened was that a friend of mine, he's a theoretical physicist, super famous, he tells me, oh my God, Paula, the glasses of the turbine hall might break and the people can damage their ears permanently. So I lived with a, so every performer was actually given a pair of plugs. And uh, usually those plugs, don't work, but we had the ones that work. So 
I was so stressed that everybody had to wear this because otherwise they would get permanent, permanent damages to their ears, which I didn't want. So in order to make sure they did, I was screaming too, and I wore them too to, you know, encourage. And so I did not hear it. This was the reason probably why I had this huge, uh, I can only hear it in these recordings. You see the video is very simple. There is not, I mean, I have better videos, I have to work at it, but um, I did not hear my work. So I, that's why I was so sad. Was the audience told in advance what it was going to consist of? Or were they unexpectedly hearing a scream? And what was the audible level? I mean, that's a cacophonous kind of chamber in Turbine Hall. The acoustics resonate. So I'm just wondering how the audience experienced it. Did they have the buds? Did they know they were going to hear a scream? Or was it totally unanticipated? So the audience knew about it. There was um, communication about it. So that's why they came. Did you see how many? There were thousands of people who came to hear this. And um, uh, the problem from my theoretical physicist friend was only for the performers. So the audience were not given any plaques. But um, uh, what happened was that we were all shocked by the um, scream because we all expected, I think thousands of people there expected an aggressive scream. Because when we think scream, we think aggressive, we all expected what we hear in the stadiums. I mean, in Italy, we scream only in the stadiums. Um, so we all expected that kind of scream. And actually, the scream, because it, I guess because it was unrehearsed, it was very human and very... Um, very, very humble and very musical rather than aggressive or stadium-like. So we were all just shocked because this is how our brain works. When you see something new, you're shocked, you're lost, you don't know anymore where your feet are. So the, that's what, there was a very strong moment of, um, that was what I experienced at least. And, but, um, for example, um, my husband, he was with me. He was smart enough to remove those tube plugs, and he just loved it. You know, it's like, whoa, oh my god. <laughs> so I guess it's all different. So um, perhaps that's uh, an appropriate moment to uh to end the talk tonight, I think um, it's been wonderful to see and hear Paola give us a sense of how interesting her life is. I can certainly testify, uh, having gotten to know her, that, that this is true. Um, and how dedicated she is to inventing things that are new, that perhaps challenge us, set us adrift, delight us and have a kind of generosity and openness uh, that I think is truly remarkable. So please join me in thanking Paolo Pugas.